So it's my pleasure, and I, I really mean that, to uh, be able to introduce uh, Emeritus Professor of History at UW Madison, Tong Chai Winichaku. Um, Tong Chai is somebody that has uh, quite the uh, reputation. So I'm sure that many of you know about his background already, but I will say a few things anyway, because that's what I'm supposed to do. Um, he's best known, I would say, probably uh, within the scholarly circles, at least, for his uh, 1994 book, Siam Map, which was the winner of the uh, Harry J. Bender Prize from the Association of Asian Studies, which is a, a very prestigious award, and also the Great Prize from the Asian Affairs Research Council in Japan. So that book has been, you know, um, not only important in Southeast Asian studies, but even in my discipline of geography, it's widely, widely known. And, uh, you know, I actually learned about this book from people in my department in Canada, not from the Southeast Asian community. And um, just to give you a sense of the influence it's had, not only in terms of uh, Western scholarship, but particularly in Asia, it's been translated now into Japanese, Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, and of course, Thai, right? And so that really indicates the, uh, those are like basically many of the major, major Asian languages of, of East Asia and uh, mainland Southeast Asia. And uh, most recently, uh, he has uh, published another book called Moments of Silence, the Unforgetting of the October 6, 1976 Massacre in Bangkok which was published by University of Hawaii Press in 2020. And that um, is a book that is, uh, I think, special, but for different reasons in the sense that it's, it, it, it draws upon some of his own personal experiences as, as being there when that massacre occurred, but goes well beyond his personal experiences as well to discuss about the broader implications of that. So um, in 1994, he received the Guggenheim Award, which is very prestigious. And then in 2003, he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And then in 2013-14, he was elected as the president of the Association of Asian Studies, which is, of course, the, the major um, uh, organization that many of us um, are members of. Now, his research interests are in the intellectual foundations of modern Siam under colonial conditions from 1880s to the 1930s, including modern geography and cartography, historical knowledge, and the rule of law. And um, he has published eight books and many articles in Thai. And I would say that um, probably his most important contribution is as a public intellectual for people in Thailand. Because um, I would say, you know, I'll, I'll just personally, I have to thank Ajahn Tong Chai because quite often when I'm in Thailand and I'm interviewing people, especially leftists, I would say, uh, of a certain generation, um, and, 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 and I, I, you know, drop Tong Chai's name, you know, everybody knows him, right? I mean, he's, he's rather iconic in Thailand for a certain generation. And uh, so, I would say that uh, you know he he has a great deal of influence over a certain group of people uh, there, and uh, and that has made my life a little bit easier actually. Uh, so thank you, Ajahn. Um, so without further ado, I think uh, I'll just invite Ajahn to come and give us a talk, and I'm really looking forward to it. I'm sure we'll all uh, be thankful for it afterwards. Thank you. I apologize if I take the mask off, not too soon. And I'm going to speak for a while, so very hot and convenient. Uh, good to be back in person. For me, I have left here in 2017. Uh, I retired in 2016, still came here a few times before in the fall of 2016, but then from the, the end of 2016, I went away to Japan and didn't return, didn't come back here for three years. Uh, I 
went, I came back here in November 2019, a few months, and then traveled in Asia, back here again in the middle of March, right before, one day before Wisconsin announced the lockdown. So uh, I have been to on campus only twice or three times in the past, and it seems then. Check out books in the library twice, <laughs> and then went to the library just this morning, the third time. Uh, <clears throat> sit there for hours. So I disappeared for years and shifting, shifted my focus, my attention to work more on time, in time. Uh, Ian said I published eight books, four of them published in the past four or five years while I was in Japan because I have time. And that's the main reason I, I like to do in the, you can call it the last phase of my career, call it the third phase of my career. And launching a new project too. The new project is what you saw on here, what you see on the front uh, I, I try to track down the, uh, what I call the modern foundation, the intellectual foundation of modern science. Geography, history, a number of things. And, and I came kind of not stumble, but let's say more. I did, it was not in my plan until about 2016. I think maybe I should tackle the issues of law. <coughs> I started to <coughs> read seriously, intensively in 2018. So what I, I give a talking time. It's a kind of a prestigious lecture, so they publish it. Even though I would say that, as you will see today, there's still some, big, some major questions left in, in this project. So it's not finished work. Not yet. <clears throat> Let me start from explaining, give you some idea what the conventional narrative of legal reform in Thailand. Conventional narrative on the foundation of modern rule of law in, in Thailand in science. Then as you have to have the outline. I, it's exactly the same as on the on the screen. So I do this for you to keep it. You can take it as homework. Do that for the audience who watch the recording. But it's uh, <coughs> almost the same. Only a few words are different. I will start from conven explaining conventional narrative of the legal reform in Thailand because that reform, that reform, uh, is a process for about. Uh, less than 20 years reform, but marking, marked by the first penal court in 1908. So if you spot the line in the outline, in the handout process, look at that line. Number one process, the first penal court, 1908. 1908. And then I'm going to move on why such a conventional narrative is problematic? In what ways? What thing? And then how I explain it differently? As a novice to the field, I have to say I'm a novice to the field of legal history. I'm not confident enough to suggest that I have debunked. I have debunked the, the narrative, I have found the alternative, but let's say I'm pretty much at least a challenge. When I was asked to referee this book, it came out this year, Thai Legal History 2021, a few months ago. I don't know how the editor knows that I'm working on legal history because that's, I'm, I'm very new. So I refuse because I think I'm a novice. So the talk today, in the talk in Thailand almost two years ago, in that spirit, I'm still working on it, but I have to say that I'm willing to say that I'm pretty much confident that I'm on the right track. 
The conventional history or conventional narrative is this. Thai legal system follow the Hindu Buddhist Dhammasatra in Thai we call Tamasa. Yeah, but it's Sanskrit word from Dhammasatra. Like other Theravada Buddhism, long story cut short is that Hindu Dhammasatra was foundation. But then when Buddhists, suspense Theravada Buddhists adopted Dhammasatra, it modified in certain ways. It modified in certain ways. And when Theravada uh, Dhammasatra, they call the same thing, transfer or travel from Sri Lanka to Mon region, southern Burma, to Burma, to Lana or another Thai, Thailand today, and to Siam. Every step there are modifications. Every step there are modifications. Yet conventional narrative don't recognize those modifications much. Some never mention, some mention the sense that it's not significant. So Tamasa or Dhammasatra, or I would call Tamasa from now on, because not only in Thai, but I would call it because it represents the Thai version of the Theravada modifications through Mon and Burma from Sri Lanka that was founded from Hindu Dhammasatra. Okay. I don't know how many, how many still. So I call Tamasa. Not because uh, not because it's fit the Thai context here, but not because we are, we are talking about Thai kids, but because it represents the Thai version. Why the Mon would call, I, I don't know the Mon language, but legal scholars written, writing in English, they call it Dhammasatra almost exactly as Hindu. I wonder they have their own tongue, they have their own pronunciation that will make it easier to, to, to make it meaningful in local context. So Tamasa, according to the conventional narrative, is like constitution. Therefore, Thai kings from the past did not have power or did not have authority to create the laws. Since the Tamasa is sacred and cannot be altered. Yes, the fact that they alter and modify all the time. But somehow the belief, the narrative say that no, it cannot be out. If you check Hindu Dhammasatra and Thai Tamasa, check it because both you can find translation of both. They are completely different. Completely different. You may argue that in principle they are similar. I would argue against that too, but let's say at least in terms of how many sections? Sections are about what? The substance in eight sections about what? In from Hindu Namasantra. Two, not the eight sections. The eight sections were collapsed into Thai version. Not the first original modification because it started to change, started to collapse. The eight section in Hindu Namasantra into other things, different things. And mixed with local legislation over hundreds of years. But if you call, compare the Hindu one and the Thai one as the beginning and the end, you see a different easily, easily. Anyway, that's not in the conventional narrative. The main, the main point for the conventional narrative is that the king did not have power or authority to create the law. They're bounded by Tamasa because it's sacred, cannot be changed. Yes, Tamasa is sacred. Tamasatra is sacred. It was written on the wall of the cosmos. Even the, 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 the what do you call the ascetic who fly over, according to the myth, fly over to the, to write down, to copy. So the original story of the, sorry, the story of the original law in Hindu Buddhist law, it was not created, it was copied. Okay, so copying is not that bad because who can create it? In the cosmos, we don't know. It's the cosmic power created it. The king was therefore neither that absolute nor above the law. The king just followed and bounded 
by the Tamasa. In addition, Buddhist king was also checked morally by the 10 royal virtues. Translation of the word Tasapita Rajadama. 10 virtue, 10 royal virtues that everything has to abide, has to follow. Those are the argument that king could not be above the law. Far from that, was bounded and limited, cannot even create the law. The king could all, only issue ordinances. You know the difference between law and ordinance, right? In English, it's a main in terms of level of law. The ordinance is like city council, city council ordinance like that. Okay. So tie it a lot to advocate this kind of version. Make it clear in his writing in English. In English. He writes in Thai, but he oversees the translation of his article in English in, the, in 1948 himself. Please tell anyone. He makes sure that it's called ordinance. Okay, this is the difference. So the conventional history goes on. Legal reform in Siam in the 1890s to 1900s. The main reason is to counter colonial threat. Because European colonial powers argued that Siam's legal system was barbaric. That could become the main reason for the colonial threat. So for Siamese rulers, we must reform in time to set independence. The evidence is that, as you know, more or less in general, I'm not going to go detail, extraterritoriality is the evidence that the European powers impose on science. And science cannot get away from extraterritoriality until they started reform and create modernized, acceptable, uh, modernized law, court laws, acceptable by European powers. Besides, conventional history goes on. In practice, the laws and judiciary in Siam at the time, by 1890s, were chaotic due to disorganized bureaucracy, inefficiency, and corruption, so on and so forth. The accused were left forgotten in prison, many of them without even a trial. Application of the same law were not consistent, neither were the ruling nor punishment of the same crime. These instances, this example, are quoted, are commented and made it clear by King Juralo Gorama the fifth himself. A legal scholar just takes his words as an explanation. So on the one hand, colonial threat set the self independent. On the other hand, our legal system is in a mess. So I better change it, modernize it. Implicitly speaking, in the eyes of Bangkok ruler, King Juralongkorn at least, this trouble can be fixed with the modernizing system, modernized legal system. That's it. No discussion about jurisprudence, no discussion about other fundamental. It just modernized, make it efficient, make it systematic. Truly trouble spot that led the European to call Thai system as barbaric legal system is, is barbaric practices, especially the mode of punishment and inequality before the law because of Thai, I mean, hierarchical ranking in some in our legal system. It's hierarchy in itself, so it cannot be equal anyway. The process, they eliminated barbaric practices, actually long before 1908, in 1986. In 1986, the first thing out is barbaric, barbaric punishment mode, get out and a few other laws, such as about witnesses, about evidence. 
Those are before the first court law was finished, but all in the 1990s and early, sorry, 1890s to early uh, 1900s. And after 1908, the first uh, penal court, uh, followed by major court laws, there are four of them, uh, civil law and procedural law in subsequent decades. That is, that considered the finish of the reform of the modern uh, uh, legal system. The reform was difficult and arduous process, mainly because the European civil system, civil law system, need to be adjusted, need to be localized in so many ways to fit the local type condition. Yes, the conventional narrative accept, accepted. But the instances of what, what, uh, what they have to localize, what they have to adapt, if you look at it, it's mostly, I would call, technical. It, so you, no argument, no discussion on fundamental uh, or fundamental or let's say the essence of Jewish Buddhist Buddhist, which I'm talking, I'm saying, I'm going to talk in a moment, what's your left of? But in the conventional narrative, that is, after adjustment, arduous process, difficult modification, we found the Thai system, uh, the Thai version of the of the internationalized, of the general standard uh, rule of law. Fortunately, the argument also goes on. The modification or localization was successful, rather smoothly, relatively speaking, easily, because several aspects of the court law system in Siam, several aspects between the court law system, sorry, in the European court law system, and the ones that existed in Siam, they are more compatible. Such as at first, there was an idea that we better, because Siam was very much influenced by the British. So they, they, they thought about following the common law. And then the idea was shut down by the king and his close right hand man, Prince Dumbo, quickly because the Thai system has written law. So why not adopt the French as a main template instead of British system common law? That's why in the Thai modern system, they adopt the civil, civil court rather than the common law. And one important thing that was uh, abolished uh, during this process too, because it is regarded at least, at least by legal scholars, by the advocate of this conventional narrative, slavery. Slavery was cited, was uh, be slavery believed to be the main uh, institution that made people unequal before the law. So slavery was abolished in 1905 a few years before the first penal court. I don't have time to go into this because it's, it's, it's a sidetrack that even here I put in a footnote. The process of abolishment of slavery in, in, in science is not as that simple. It's true. If we think slavery make people theoretically equal, then it's long before 1905. It may have something to do with the legal reform process, but it has more to do of the dying system long before 1905. Slavery and internal politics, I can't say that they, they, they went hand in hand. The abolishment of slavery in, in science was pretty much economic and political process rather than about legal reform. It, it took place in step before that because the royal palace want to undermine the power of the lords of the Kunan. That is to so the in step abolished slavery, part of this, part of that, part of that. Until 1905, slavery was not functioned anymore. The serf and slavery system was was like a long, even long forgotten. Even Prince of Rome himself took it wrong when he explained this system. Please don't wrong. Think about it. 
He wrote it, he wrote, he wrote a piece, this long story, story. He wrote a piece about the, the pride of the self system in 1930, 29, in 1927 or 29, I don't remember. He got it all wrong because it's a remote past. So he, he got it wrong. So slavery is a different process, but let's say the conventional narrative of legal reform take it as a significant step, significant mark of making making legal equality, making legal legal equality uh, become true in science. In conventional narrative, the outcome, the outcome, legal reform successfully. And time we save the country's independence. No more barbaric punishment. Legal equality was achieved in principle with the end of slavery. And most importantly, this is the beginning of modern rule of law in Thailand. Lots of implication legacies of this narrative such as Thailand owes to King Chulalongkorn, the princess, the ruling elite of that generation, for the independence of the country and for the beginning of rule of law. Most of them, I would say all of them, all of them of conventional uh, historian, legal historian, conventional scholars who, are, who agree with the subscribe to this idea, they agree that rule of law in Thailand is imperfect. They would argue that rule of law in every country is imperfect, which I agree. Rule of law in every country is imperfect. In time, it's imperfect, but it's on its way to become what I would call the normative rule of law. I don't like this word, but I don't know what else to say. Normative as if something standard. But let's say call it that way, the European, the Western, the Farang, call it uh, fine with me. But let's say there's something target, something that we think they're better than the city rule of law in our country, in Thailand. There's something there. Uh, especially people look up to the West, look up to the West, even the West, US and Europe are not the same. Anyway, they look up to that kind of approximately speaking normative rule of law. They believe that Thailand is on its way to normative rule of law. Once you heard this, I'm not sure, maybe you are so young, most people are so young to recognize modernization theory anymore. <laughs> but people who are old enough, you know, recognize I grew up at the time we ditch the modernization theory. So when I grew up, when I did my grad school, that modernization theory is already out of the door, out of the way. But right now, I'm not sure it's not, but in conventional narrative, it is still that kind of explanation. We are, we establish rule of law, whatever imperfection, we are on the way to become normal, standardized, internationally recognized rule of law. Then they explain imperfection or problems that mainly because people, users, enforcers, etc., who still don't understand the rule of law. They don't respect the laws. Selfishness, ignorance, so on and so forth, despite the system and law courts that are pretty good and up to international standards, you still can find that kind of argument in recent books published by legal scholars, by professors in law school in Thai. Uh, as late as a few years ago, you still can find that, that kind of excuse or that kind of explanation, depends on, you may not call it excuse, I call it excuse. You find it in the newspaper in the name. It has been going on like that for decades. What's the problem with this narrative? Mainly the politicization of judiciary in Thailand since 2005, 
that partly responsible for the downfall of that elected government in 2006 and the crisis since then, 15 years, 16 years already. Mainly that process. Yes, pervasive abuse, injustice. We all know, Thai people know in our life. But since then, even much more, and especially politicized one. Politicized abuse of law of the legal process, injustice, political injustice, using law, using legal process. The concrete issue that we all may have heard about it is less medicine. Article 112 in the penal code. I'm not going to detail. If you're interested, talk to Tao there because she works on this since 2014, cool, and says in 2006. All the abuse, abuses for political reasons was rampant, was, was, I would say, shameless to the point that I. I stopped following Thai news for a few months already. I only read headlines and go to the news rarely once in a while. Recently, I watch TV drama rather than Thai news. <laughs> it's unbearable. Injustice is so unbearable to me. I'm not sure, but for me, it's so painful to me. Because 40, 50 years it means we have done nothing. We have made no progress at all. It's even worse. And it's unbearable to me what's happening. It's unbearable to accept that. Uh, at least me and my number of my friends' life, uh, we have wasted for, for years, quiet energy for years. It's getting worse than even 40, 50 years before. So the solution is. I think it's a good escapism to stop what following news. <clears throat> the question is, is it an unusual and temporary problem? All these problems reveal the true legal system. Most Thai legal scholar, I would say most, I say it again, most, not everybody, but I'm confident to say most. They don't look at this. It's a systemic problem. It's a problem of bad people, bad people. But the system is good. Is that familiar <laughs> argument? Yeah. If the normative rule of law was the outcome of struggles between the crown and the bourgeoisie in Europe, Next question. Was it possible for the normative rule of law in science to be given by the absolute monarchy? This is a simple question, right? This question is so simple. If the normative rule of law began with a struggle between the bourgeoisie and the crown in Europe, many centuries, is it weird that in Thailand rule of law, normative rule of law was given by the absolute monarchy? Great country. I know that, sorry about my sarcasm. It's unusual, but a simple question, but people did not ask. The conventional narrative suggests that it was, yes, it was given by the absolute monarchy, and it has been. Recent phenomena of problems that I mentioned in Britain a moment ago suggest otherwise, especially the state is entitled so much legal privilege, privileges, even impunity. Then my question, ultimate question is, is the conventional narrative convincing what's the flaw? Is it because of people, bad apples, or is systemic, or is it fundamental? <clears throat> I 
A few comments. Actually, after I made this slide yesterday, I have added two or three more. So I'm going to read it through, <coughs> including these this two. First, some issues in conventional history are so simplistic. And in fact, in fact, among historians, not historian, not legal historians, among historians who are not who did not pay attention to the legal history field. We have gone over those issues already. But some, uh, some issues that are so simplistic, but uh, legal historian have not have not examined critically, such as the Thomas up as the constitution. All kings are bounded by Thomas up. That's so simple issue. Have not been examined until this book came out a few months ago, but I was lucky to have the opportunity to read the article by Chris Baker in this. He wrote an article about, about I got it in 2018 when I started uh, doing my research. I uh, asked him and he said to me, Chris is not a legal historian. He's a historian. He's trying to solve so many things. One of them is Kunchanku Pan, the classic literature. But he, he, he studied this because he's classic literature. Tamasa is classic literature. And he studied how, how Tamasa has been evolved, modified over time and through many cultures. And in fact, he's not the first one. If uh, people are not ignorant enough and the scholars are not ignorant, some in English have been written since 1930s, how Tamasai was modified from Hindu to Burma. Since 1930s, late 1930s or early 1940s, you can find it. But somehow it did not get to the Thai legal history. I'm not saying that everybody, I believe that there are somebody, uh, when I read uh, some hint that people could questioning this point, that point, but that's not really uh, have the challenge or work on it uh, seriously. Number two, recent historiography on the reform of uh, King Zhuang Gong has no impact on the field of legal history. Thai legal history, for example, I just mentioned a moment ago, abolition of slavery. It did not get through the Thai legal history field, even though the knowledge I, I talked to you a moment ago is how in this political economy, it's not my research, no, I'm not good at that. I learned from other people since I was a student. It's even among historians knowledge. It's common knowledge among historians. Slavery did not, because inequality, slavery did not solve inequality either. But somehow, legal historian did not take any of those later or recent historiography. Number three, conceptual frame outdated and has been debunked. Siam never colonized, so on and so forth, self-independence, so on and so forth. At least if I can take some credit, not so much, but some credit. Since I wrote my book, you cannot say anymore that Siam was not colonized. At least have to say, say my colony. Then explain, because say my colonial, say my colony is a kind of catch-all word. There are some people called crypto colony, uh, some people call whatever. Many people have established that since, not since me, I take small credit because the origin of this questioning seriously is 1978 article by Benedict Anderson. So it was questioned 40, 50 years ago and elaborated mainly in 1990s, in 19, late 1890. From now, from, from then on, most people who say Thai Sai was never colonized, at least they put in quotation mark. Because it's a problematic term. You can see Siam was never colonized without quotation mark in guidebooks. But in scholarly literature, they will put quotation mark. Because it's been argued for, for a long time. Thai historians may hardly admit that, agree with that. Later generations agree with that. But somehow, in legal history field, they mention. 
the frame of colonial threat to self independent was questioned, was challenged, has been modified, has been argued extensively for at least 20 years. No impact. Royal nationalism, what I call royal nationalism history. The king transformed reform in time, created modern state in time to self independent. In legal history, we also saw what I explained, we call in what I explained a moment ago, conventionality, illegal history term. We call transplantation theory. Most legal historians know more transplantation. In the field of legal history since 1990s, at least two major influences came into the field of legal history, not just science. Not science, I would say, you can know impact for style legal history, but for uh, legal history in general and including legal history in Southeast Asia. Yes, in many other countries, you got this. One is legal anthropology. Two, is post-colonial legal studies. Why they have impact? Back to the basic, because of our legal system is brief, social and political relations that are historically and culturally particular. Back to the basic. So we may continue to call every legal system in the world now, as long as it's modern now, Look modern rule of law up to you, but legal scholars are aware now. They are aware that at least we have to look at different kinds of rule of law. Otherwise, maybe we have to use the word rule of law more carefully or with quotation marks. In Southeast Asian legal studies, there are a number of words I mentioned only these two, and thank Terrell to introduce me. I started in 19, in 2018, I wonder where to go. I know the classic one like Tom Ginsburg. Ginsburg, uh, a of Chicago, he wrote about Japan. And he adopted this direction, this approach for a long time. Don't take law of law as the same. But long time meaning since 19, I think Tom Ginsburg started publishing since 1970s. It spread, it became more, common in Southeast Asian studies, a number of people, including uh, our Mark Saito too, who studied uh, Vietnam, uh, uh, following this kind of uh, social relations, uh, particular social relations, particular historical uh, context, result in particular social system, even though try to become a modern world law, uh, you can't avoid uh, just uh, making it somehow localized or fit the local context. These two in Southeast Asia, uh, one about Singapore, one about Burma. For Jody Raja, I feel that in Singapore is authoritarian rule of law. It's kind of oxymoronic because authoritarian rule of law is not supposed to go together. But somehow he used that term rather, rather than uh, relating the word rule of law. Let's go and read it, what he explained. He, he explained in nutshell bifurcation in Singapore. Certain area, the state is authoritarian. Certain areas, first rate rule of law. You make it simpler than that. I would, if I would make it simpler than that, for the state and people relation, anything in both security is authoritarian. The rest is first rate rule of law. Make judgment. Argues at length. Argues at length, we will not call it rule of law in Burma. It's not. And he studied colonial period, not the modern time. He studied argued that that's the foundation of modern, world, modern legal system in, in Burma. And it's not rule of law system. Nick Chisholm gives it the name, law and order system. I get his spirit. I don't like law and order system. It's too much like a TV series. <laughs> <laughs> but I get his spirit. I get his reason, especially I get it why he did not 
or I would say why he would caution everybody who use the word rule of law. And the way to make it so striking is not using it. Call whatever, even law and order, is better than misleading by calling rule of law. It's not. Now, I don't have a lot of time. I think it's enough. Uh, I'm going to go quickly and uh, introduce you the rest. And uh, sorry, I think, but I think at least for up to this is half of, of what I prepared to, to present. At least I, I hope that I lay the case, uh, I hope convincingly why it's misunderstood. I will go on quickly for a little more, five more minutes and then should leave it here. It's, we can read this on the, on the screen. Keep in mind the European context. I don't mean that that is better than is correct, just for the sake of comparison. Just for the sake of comparison. Because if rule of law in Thailand was introduced by absolute monarchy, what about Queen Duro? I know it took time, it took decades, it took centuries. But let's say from the beginning, so much different in terms of context. This is also a simple approach by historian. Look at context, they're different. How come the result will be the same? Impossible. Then how much different that that the rest of the of the of the of the talk, the rest of the book that I may not have time. Sign or semi colony. Monarchy. To others, the new wave of argument among younger legal historians, I would call myself in that not because I'm young by age, but because I'm a novice. But we look back at how Kamasa was born in it, very important point. In relation to the question whether or not the king has authority to create law. We found that, yes, the king did not time. The king did all the time with justification. Maybe similar, but maybe even worse. Not worse, not the right word. Maybe even more over. Maybe similar to the way Buddhism has been modified. But even more over, meaning every time they try to reform or change, create new laws, King would refer to the Tamasa as the final authority. Similar to what I call Buddhism, whenever there was a reform of Buddhism, they always say that this is true to the Tipitaka. This followed the Peter Carr. We just misunderstood them, misinterpreted them. The correct interpretation is, is, is what I suggest, which in fact is modification. When Thai kings create new laws, covenant, not ordinance, covenant laws, Thai kings did that by referring to authority given to them by the Thomasa all the time. But they did create new laws. Under absolute monarchy, the king also reformed Korean new law by that time, by that time, about mid, mid 19th century on. Thai king stopped referring to Tamasa. No, they don't need to. They are modern already. But they argue that, well, they are absolute monarch anyway. So they can create the law. Sign so legal creation, legal tradition was not was not incompatible with the king authority under absolute monarchy to create a whole set of new laws because the tradition was not, the entire tradition, the king was not bound, was not bounded by Thomas and the 10 royal virtues 
to the extent that they cannot create new law, that misunderstanding. What else? The legal reform in the context of creation of modern state, singular territorial sovereignty, which is that's why they want the king himself want to stop the chaotic and messy legal system for the purpose of creating modern state. Now, having a standardized, accessible law court and systematic judiciary, that that uh, that uh, that uh, attribute for the modern state for sure. But are those attributes also automatically mean also automatically means that it is rule of law? No. Somehow in Thailand, legal scholars take the fact that the law courts written down accessible by the public. This is a big change. If before the mid 19th century, people cannot access the law. The law belonged to the hands of the rulers. They changed that. But I say again, standardized, accessible throughout the country, systematic, and one major judicial system. That make these components make it a part of the modern state, modern legal system. But does it make rule of law? Rule of law, the normative one, so-called normative one, was created by the bourgeoisie in the struggle between the bourgeoisie and the crowd. Or what? You should be, you should know it to limit the power authority of the state from encroaching individuals, from encroaching from from encroaching individual rights and property to again to guarantee liberty, freedom, and right not to be interfering intervene too much by the state. That's how the fighting today is about abortion, about mass. See, it goes on and on. Where is the line, right? But at least in principle, rule of law everywhere in Western world is for the bourgeoisie to limit the authority of the crown. In Thailand, modern legal system is for the absolute state to rule more effectively. It's the opposite. Keep in mind that no secularism in science. Keep in mind that in Thailand, the ideas, in Buddhist ideas of, of uh, political power is opposite from the bourgeois, uh, from Lord Acton. Uh, what you say, uh, power corrupt, right? Absolute power corrupt, absolutely. But in Buddhism, power reflects virtue. Absolute power reflects absolute virtue. So the state is the rep state represents the greater good. Individuals is secondary. This is my simplified version. Individual is secondary to collective good that was represented by the state. And therefore, I'm going to go quickly from now, very quickly. This is it, the foundation of the modern law. It's the law for the absolute monarchy. It's a rule by law, no rule of law, because it's compatible with legal tradition that the king has authority to create the law, that the king and the state represent the great good, represent have to take care of the public. In the Thai world, they use the word that like a, any other feudal system in the world to protect people. The state have the mission to protect people. So the security of the state is supreme, is the first and foremost mission of the state. I go on to talk about two major characteristics. I list them in the handout, I, even though I prepare uh, I, I I never dream of finishing all seven or eight points. No, I just just list it all for you to because from being here on, in fact, in, even in my book in time, I skip over the major period how the rule of law or how the legal system has 
was developed as the authoritarian this big chunk, only 50 years. But I jump to the reason. Reason, reason that I try to characterize. I try to present legal system that I see. One thing, the one is that the first, the first, I, I summarize it two things. The first is the law, the system gives so much privileges to the state. At this point, I, I look up the dictionary for the word privileges that use in law so many times. In the past two years, I'm not sure it's the right word, but I call, I call it this way. Privilege in our time, you can read it because it represents the security. Good. Security is the main reason for the privilege. Security of what? Security of the state. Need protection to become impunity. Impunity is one of the major problems, major cancer that showed up in the past 10, 15 years. To the point that, to the extent that I don't believe that it is bad happens, is the system, but you need more examination. What more in the past? It did show up in the on the continent. The cook every group to themselves on their own things faster than ever. But let's say in recent in, in the past 15 years, in was even much more mature than themselves to the little things such as police brutality and other things. I also look at at least comparison because the kind of state privileges is not right. The US states have away from the territory, US territory, you can keep them as long as you want. And sign this and that law, part of Patriot Act too. Somehow give the people to the state. But otherwise, so, some other countries such as Japan. Singapore also gives some privilege to the state, but very, very minor for Japan, such as favor the state economic policy. Any issue on personal property, Singapore more authoritarian than that. Go and go and read uh, public space about public gathering, about public speaking, so and so forth. Seven of them. None, no country have ever given the privilege to the extent that let the state have the impunity privilege. In fact, in Japan and Singapore, because they have so much privilege, the state has so much privilege already. If they have used the privilege. The punishment seems to be harsher. Entirely opposite. The state policy personnel have this privilege. I talk about the state suspension of rule of law under emergency law. The second character of the present rule of the present rule uh, legal system, which I believe that it came from the past as well. I, I try to explain it. But no time here. In favor of the national law. So we better go back to Buddhism. We better go back to culture. In this case, meaning monarchy. Many legal scholars, especially the past 20 years, argue that this monarchy is a true constitution. That's why Thailand turned out paper constitution so easy because it's not significant the true constitution is a monarchy that one cannot be torn down what else sovereignty of the countries that belong to the king yeah 
Did it say that? Legal scholar did say that. Yes, not the minor ones. Very prominent legal scholar. That's why every time there's a coup, the sovereignty returned to the king. Meaning, sovereignty under democracy is given or allowed by the king. You guys practice democracy. When you fail, back to me. They ask me that. I mentioned this part because these are the basis, these are the fundamentals of the legal system. Individuals are almost so unit of law, not in Thailand. Secular law, not in Thailand. Constitution, not in Thailand. Sovereignty belongs to people or the king in Thailand. The argument belongs to the king. So on and so forth. That allowed the king to have direct authority over arms, armed unit. Yes, the present king, by the law a few years ago, now have authority, direct authority to control, to administer armed services, certain sectors. Own huge property, have authority, final say about the Sangha matter. Except the form of the government, I would say this is absolute monarchy. And I call about the law because there's also laws that the king can do no wrong. So he has power in those areas that I mentioned, but he is not accountable. Nobody can criticize, nobody can argue, nobody can challenge the king's authority. That's it above the law. Absolute monarchy doesn't mean he has absolute power in terms of no factions. No, every, every absolute monarch has factions in the court. Absolute monarchy means the king is above the law. I am here. Sorry for taking so long. <laughs>